Nobody knows her name. Nobody knows when she will strike. All they know is that she is a deadly bounty hunter, and her latest mission has taken her to Coruscant, home of the Jedi. Her target, an old friend of Qui-Gon Jinn's. Qui-Gon and his apprentice, Obi-Wan Kenobi, make an attempt to catch her and fail. Now they are her targets, too. Welcome to this week's Padawan Library, the Star Wars Junior Novel Podcast, the podcast that goes so in-depth on these books, we are more in-depth than Wikipedia articles are. Yeah, we're going to be sources on Wikipedia. Yeah, we're the, we are your source to get the most information about these books. Who are the couples? Who's fucking? Yeah, nobody's talking about how Den and Andra fuck all the time on Wikipedia. There's some mention about something about them getting married. You know, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Mm -hmm. But, like, no mention about them fucking. And I think we have the insight. I think so, too. And I think there's two characters that may have fud in uh, this book. Fud? Fa you, Paul McCartney, fud. Oh, my God. This is... (laughs) I'm putting it in the past tense. We are... uh... (laughs) Anyway. We are alienating our entire audience right now <laughs> with our with our 2018 Paul Check McCartney out. references. Oh, that's the best Paul McCartney references. Oh, anyway, love I'm love Levi it. Paratic. With me as always, Tim May. Tim May, hey. right here. Yep, we're, <laughs> all, we're already in the thick of it. Off um, to a crazy start. So this week, this week, we're doing The Deadly Hunter, book 11 of Jedi Apprentice. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Yep. I did something kind of fun last week. You did, did you? Yes, I, uh, I, I, you know, I've done this a couple times, but yet last week was May 25th, which as we discussed in a recent episode, the we, true the, Star we Wars believe day. is the true Star Wars day. So um, when that falls on a Saturday, sometimes me and my brother and some of our friends like to try to watch the entire saga. And by the entire saga, I don't mean the supposed end of the Skywalker saga coming up this year. One through six, let's be... Re- First of all, for reasonable time right, yeah. length. And also, because that's the actual story, these new movies are a new thing. And that's fine. And, you know, a lot of the big fans of these new movies, when you say that, they think you're insulting them. I'm really not. They're just a different thing. It's a separate it's series. It's its own... It, there's the six, and then there's the rest. Yeah, that's, that's all I'm saying. It's fine. That's all I'm saying. So anyway, uh, I've done... I've probably... Only, I watched them all the way through once with you. Yeah, when the Blu-ray when came the Blu-rays out. When the came out together. And when we were in college... We did that, and that was a fun, a fun time. Although I think I slept through. I, I remember we, one of them. It, it was attack. It was attack of the clones. Yes. and you got up and you were pacing the floor of my apartment. I was like, Tim, why don't you sit down? And you're just like, I'm trying to stay awake. <laughs> it's true. I was. I think it's interesting that you said that about attack of the clones because on this watch through, I, I really focused on the prequel trilogy as a trilogy in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Like, how does it work? Just as a story unto itself. And, uh, you know, a lot of our listeners are probably big prequel fans. Like, I would hope so. And, and, yeah, like that's that's probably the core audience of our show. Because we focus a lot on the prequel era of books. But I think, from right- I think you know, if you go back and listen to our first episode, both of us rank the first two Star Wars movies. I mean, Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back as the two best Star Wars right. movies. And honestly... The original trilogy is my favorite Star Wars stuff by a lot. Like, I love the prequel trilogy, and I especially love Revenge of the Sith. But, so, but I was focusing on the prequels this time, partly because it's earlier in the day. We watched them in, you know, chronological order. And, uh, 
they really it hangs together, man. It's, a, <laughs> it's own trilogy in a very interesting way. I thought anyway, because I uh, and uh, interesting thing, you know, we talked we talked a lot about Phantom Menace recently, but um, that movie bumped up slightly in my estimation. Oh, on this watch. It went up. Uh, typically, I would usually rate that movie like three stars or three and a half, um, and. It's definitively solidly three and a half, and it could go to four. <laughs> this is out of five, of course. And then, but the biggest thing is, and I've been slowly moving in this direction with this movie over the course of the last, you know, 15 years or whatever, but Attack of the Clones, I will posit, is after the first, I mean, I think the first 20 minutes are good, but especially once Anakin and Padme get to Naboo, just rules from that point forward. <laughs> that movie is very entertaining and moves very well. And uh, I, I bumped, I gotta say, I bumped it up to a four out of five, Debbie. It's funny, you, <clears throat> it's funny you say that because I have always had like a chip on my shoulder about Attack of the Clones. I've always said it's like the worst prequel. And I think it was over the winter, um, Mel and I, she wanted to watch Attack of the Clones, so I did. And it was like, I loved it. Like, it, it, my opinion totally changed on it. It's really well it made. It is. It is great. And we'll be talking a little Attack of the Clones during the book section for so, one specific reason. We'll, you'll, we'll get to it. But um, <laughs> but this, uh, this movie, like, okay, you know, the big criticism of the movie, of course, and it, it, I should maybe save this for three years from now when we do our 20th anniversary Well, podcast. I mean, we can also get into this in Jedi Quest, but go ahead. I mean, but it's worth mentioning. This is... The big criticism of that movie, the biggest one, probably, besides the losers that are just like, I can't handle CGI. You know, <laughs> okay, whatever. That's That, to me, is a non-starter of an issue. But if you look at, say, um, you know, the romance between yes, Anakin and Padme, that's... that's always the big criticism. Here's what I'll say about it. Here's the criticism I will make of it. The first chunk of the movie, before they get to Naboo... They lean way too into Anakin being a weirdo creep. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's a problem. But I will say, once the attraction seems mutual, on once they get to Naboo, especially when they... Then I think it's not... Like, it, th- their relationship works. It's a very fucked up relationship. But I think... I believe it, is my point. Well, you mentioned Naboo, because I think, in my opinion, one of the most cringeworthy moments of the romance happens yeah. there, and it's the sand scene. Well, with, so of course, that's, where, that's but, the classic. But, 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 but yes. what freaks me out about that scene is the way that he gently touches Padme's arm. Oh, of course, arm, that's weird, she, of course. It's a little strange. Um, but I will, I do think, um, but, like, I, I like the, you know, political debates mm-hmm. and the... And I like them. In, I like them in the field. I don't care. What, like that's just fun to me. They're fun in that scene together. And like she's just like you know when he's talking about all his fascist bullshit, she's like thinks he's joking. And he's like, yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> and like that's like real shit that happens in real life. Yeah. People are shocked. Like it's like, oh my god, my husband voted for Trump. What the hell? <laughs> you know, like when did this happen? <laughs> I love that scene too because like he actually pretends that he's like dead like and Padme is very yeah, concerned about his safety <laughs> and like he pulls that fucked up joke I've always liked the Obi-Wan part of the movie but it it really works uh, everything about it and I think you know just the climax is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. It's really good. And that movie's good. My only criticism about that movie and I guess with a little bit of episode 3 as well you know we have Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan in episode one, but we don't ever get like a full-on adventure out of Obi-Wan yeah, and Anakin. No, that, no that's an issue for but, sure. But I'm, that's what we have Jude Watson for. That's what we got so. Jedi Quest for. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited about that. That's coming up in November. <laughs> <laughs> After Galaxy of Fear. But it's as interesting because I... And we posted some pictures on Instagram from this day. Uh, it was very long. Yes. We started at 8.30. Now, now I have a question about these yes. photos. Did you sit on the floor the entire time? No, I needed to take pictures that included the, oh. a shot from the movie, so I got up and was like, oh, let's do it with this part. Because <laughs> I, yes, I'm sitting on the floor and all these pictures of me watching each movie. You know, no, I sat in a chair. I okay, good. I, my back would have fallen off. I, I, that's what I figured. I know you are a very uh, fragile man I have, a, I have a lot of back issues. 
and a lot of uh, you know other things happening with my uh, bodily processes. Oh well, we so so it's a so yes, I could not sit on a floor in front of a television all day. That would have been obscene. Now let's um out of the I guess out of the prequels, um, who are your favorite uh it, uh. What's uh, the sideline characters aside from your main cast? Who were the ones that stand out in well, your mind? On the prequels, I mean, we talked a little on the episode one podcast about Captain Panaka, mm-hmm. the huge, Hunts of Gangsters. I'm a huge Captain Panaka, Rick Ollier fan. We talked all about that. In episode two, of course, Dexter Jetster, mm-hmm. who we are going to talk about a lot on this podcast, um, is uh, one of my favorite characters. I uh, I love um, Elon Slees Bagano. Mm-hmm. Uh, mainly because I just realized this. He's played by the same actor who played Mouse in The Matrix, the first Matrix Oh, movie. I didn't know Mouse that. Mouse is the, like, programmer guy that comes up with the, the woman in the red dress, you know, that part. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, he dies uh, like everybody in that movie except the main characters. Um, uh, but, yeah, it's the same actor. Because they shot, they, both those movies shot in Sydney, which uh, I guess it's not surprising there's a little overlap. And actually, the interestingly enough, James McTeague, who is the uh, who was the assistant director on the Matrix trilogy, was also the assistant director on Attack of the Clones. I noticed on this watch. Um, Here's something interesting about Elon Sleeves Vagano because we had mentioned. I think we brought he was brought up once before, and there was something about his name, like a name change. There's some possibly. issue with yes. All right, so in I the, think we talked about this because. There was a character named Elon, and I yes. I listed all the characters named Elon. In, yeah, in that's Wars. exactly it. Mark of the Crown episode. Uh, yes, ha- yes. Um, Long time ago. So there's in the canon tab on Wikipedia, he is Elon Slees Bagano, S L E A Z E B A G G A N O. Okay, so they haven't changed it for canon. It hasn't been changed for canon. Good, good. Now in the Legends tab, though, it's Elon Slees. Bagano. So it's S E L apostrophe capital S A B A G N O. That's almost like more cell Bagano. Yeah, it's not so much sleaze. And I wonder, like. They were just too embarrassed by the goofiness of the name. I guess so. The I char- don't like Hang that. on, this is the behind the scenes. The character was named by George Lucas. Um. Hmm. 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 Uh. All of those sleaze Bagano has ears in production photos as refer- and in reference images by IL- um, ILM ultimately removed them and replaced them with antenna palps for the movie because they were considered redundant for the character to both have antennae and ears. So, didn't know this, his ears, his human ears, were removed CGI. They oh, removed wow. his ears in the movie. Well, and I'm looking at a screenshot his li- his here. Li- his little mouse ears. Yes. <laughs> 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 Bringing it all together. <laughs> I'm, I, 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 it doesn't say anything here. I wonder why he has... Which... Like, where does this name change happen? Why is there a difference in the names, I want to know? Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, whatever. This is a we'll we'll do our research and we will have a full segment prepared for this in within a couple episodes. Um, okay. <laughs> let's see. Sith is the other one that with small characters. Right. I would say, um, you know, there's the fewer characters like that. I like the guy on Utapau, the main Utapau guy. I can't. Oh yeah, I don't remember his name. Oh that I, Tion Mion. That's You're right. His name. Yeah. He was a sneak preview figure. Yes, I like him. I like. Uh, um, I did. Would you say Ayla Sakura counts as a minor character because, like, she was like very hyped, like in merchandise and yeah, stuff. Yeah. But she's on screen for like two seconds. Two seconds in each she, movie. She basically. gets shot in the back. Yeah. Um, I mean, she's in the comics a lot. The Dark Horse books from the time. Um, um, do you know who uh, who plays Tian Mian? Uh, it looks like it's Bruce. Spence. Yeah, you're reading it here. Um, but he, mm. um, I'm pretty sure he's like the only actor to be in. Star Wars, Harry Potter, and Lord of the Rings. The only one? The only one. And he hmm. was also in Mad... Oh, it says here he was also in Mad Max and The Matrix. Jesus! Let's actually look up his IMDb now. I'm this curious. is important. Bruce Spence. This is now a Bruce Spence podcast. <laughs> yeah, because he was... Holy shit! He was the gyro captain in... Uh, in Road Warrior. Yeah. That rules! 
Yeah, okay. And and he shows back up. Yeah, that oh that guy, he's like one of my favorite characters. Yeah, when he, he shows up in Beyond Thunderdome. It's so cool. Like, oh my god. Oh, he was in parts of the Caribbean. Oh, he's in all of them. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, not on the same level, but... Definitely not. Chronicles of Narnia. Who did he play in Harry Potter? Um, I, hang on, let me get here. Let's see here. I could be wrong about that, but I feel like that was a fact that I read... At like one time in my That's life. That's not going to be true that much longer. There's got to be someone. Right. You would think so. Oh, oh my Lord. He was in Ace Ventura when nature calls. Oh. Do you remember one of the poachers <laughs> that steals the albino bat? He's one of those. Oh my God. No. Oh, That's the best sequel. Steve Odenkirk, my boy. Yeah. Thumb words. There we go. Back to Star Wars. <laughs> we got it there. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong about this Harry Potter thing. Okay. I was going to say. But... Who's even in Lord of the Rings? He is. Where is it here? Oh, come on. Let's go back. He was, it was up in the. Uh, Black Lieutenant. Oh, rando. Yeah, totally rando. But he's been in a ton of stuff. So, anyway. That's cool. Thumb Wars. I just watched that recently. That's not good. Well, yeah. Steve Odenkirk is. No. May, maybe not the comedy that ages the best. No. I um, haven't watched Kung Pao in a few years. I have. I still think it's stupidly funny, but it's also like super racist. It's, it's yeah, it's super racist, but it's also wow, this movie is so dumb. Like this, yeah. is, like, this is the dumbest level of humor imaginable. Check out Kung Pao Enter the Fist. <laughs> oh man. So anyway, and then on to the classic trilogy. I'm not going to talk oh, about my favorite forgot, side character. You forgot uh, one you forgot one mention. You actually messaged me about this character. Poggle the Lesser. Oh, I love Poggle the Lesser. Po- like 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 the great James Lucino, I'm a big fan of Poggle mm-hmm. the Lesser. He's in all of James Lucino's <laughs> books, practically. He even brought him into Catalyst, yes, the Rogue One is, prequel. Yeah. Exactly. When that book opened with a Poggle the Lesser prologue, I was like, I'm in for the greatness. Um, anyway, so... Uh, yeah, he's awesome. And just, like, uh, his scenes with Dooku are just... They rule. That, that, and that, that movie's a lot of fun. Um... The original trilogy, we're not going to talk about side characters. We all know what yeah. the great side characters from that trilogy are. But um, that movie, th- those movies, I, uh, I I was intermittently sleeping through most of them. <laughs> um, but one thing I'll say is that I've only done, I think I've done this about four times. I think I did it once, like in maybe like around 07, 08, somewhere in that range, like not that long after Sith. And then I did it... Uh, once on another May 25th that was a Saturday and I did it once with you when the Blu-rays came out and now this it works so well just as like a single narrative mm. you know uh, it, like it really works The <laughs> I like I don't know what to tell people when they like make fun of like Rick McCollum or whatever that, or like they make fun of these ring theory people I mean it's not a theory it's just an actual analysis I'll make fun of them for that like the way people talk about movies on the internet Ugh. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, not, not every analysis of something is a theory, guys. Come on. Uh, um, sometimes it's just like, oh, I recognize the parallelism in the Star Wars trilogy. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay, cool. That's not a theory. That's just basic textual analysis. And, and on, <laughs> on the subject of parallelism and us watching the Blu-ray cut, the Blu-ray cut famously added... James Earl Jones uh, saying no yeah. when he oh, throws the but emperor remember down. Remember when we watched it? I was like insistent that I couldn't even hear it. <laughs> like it's it's I, it's, it's low. It's pretty low in the mix. It's, like unless you knew it was happening, you could miss it. Yeah, without um, it. We watched the DVDs, the 2004 DVDs, which are my preferred. Yeah, I mean, my preferred cut of the original movie is the original cut. This, uh, look at it. Well, we haven't really talked about no, this. No, we haven't. Okay. My preferred version of Star Wars is Star Wars. Mm-hmm. 1977. Um, you know, I'm not mad about the Greedo Han thing, but it's a dumb change. Uh, and uh, the Jabba scene's fun, but kind of superfluous, and the CGI is aged pretty oh, badly. Oh, and even though George has changed that CGI multiple times... I still... It just doesn't work. It doesn't dude. look right, and the frickin' walk over the tail... It's, have you heard of a cutaway? You could cut away yeah. to another superfluous Show, shot of Boba Fett. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the cutaway is... Like, just cut away from it. Why did you spend so much money to make Han 
terribly walk over mm-hmm. his tail. I, I, I will, right now I'm raising my hand up like, <laughs> like, like, like he's like a, he's like a little paper puppet man. Yeah, and there's like these weird like, oh, uh, and also Jabba seems small. Jabba seems... He's so much bigger in Jedi. He's way huger in Jedi. Even in Phantom Menace, like, when he's CG again, like, he seems bigger in that. Yes. Um, it's because they had to fit him in, in the shot. It, it does, but, whatever. I'm not a huge fan of that scene. But that version... That movie, I could watch any version. They're all basically fine. Yeah. Um, Empire, the 2004 cut, is my preferred version because I like having Ian in there. Mm-hmm. Ian McDermott, I like... Yes. I mean, I wish... I think I'd rather they just have him dub the voiceover, which, did they do that in 97, maybe? I don't think they did. I'm not sure. Did. But um, I'd rather they have just had him dub the voiceover, because he, he looks just like uh, like Frogman Sith, uh, Revenge of the Sith. Uh. Isn't there, I swear there's something... They I, shot it on the set of Revenge of the Sith, I believe. Yes, yes, so, they did. Yes, so, so that's, he's got that weird neck thing Yeah, going wait, on. so that part is whatever, but I prefer having him there. And then uh, with Jedi... It's a couple issues I have with the special edition, but mainly I do prefer the 2004 version. Having when you watch these movies all together, having Hayden at the end of that that movie is a emotional gut punch. Yeah, right? it is. And and I prefer the new uh, score at the end of the movie too. Sorry, Yub Nub fans, you're <laughs> freaks. You're freaks is what I'm saying. I'm saying that to all the people in our audience. You're freaks uh, if you like the Yub Nub song better. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you can like what you like, but uh, right. I, I, I've never really gotten why that was a huge uproar for people. The only big problem with the, with either special edition version of uh, Jedi oh, oh. is Jedi Rocks is a disaster. Oh, Jedi it's Rocks is so bad. But it's also like, I'm at the point where I just like it. It's like, it's like when you invest so much energy thinking something stupid, you eventually just like it. Yep. You know? So, uh... You know, at this, at this point, I'm like, oh man, I sing along to the song. Yeah. It's fun. It's not good. Some, but I also, the original scene is not good. Something but, that I, has always, and we've never tackled this on this show, and I, I bitch about it all the time, I, not all the time with you, but in the special edition footage of Boba Fett that they added to Jabba's Palace, more Boba Fett in the movie. For really no reason. Um, <laughs> He's pretty prominently featured already. In yeah, I know. His antenna is on the wrong side of his helmet. And as I bet that I bet there was something else wrong with the footage, and they're like, just flip it. Yeah, just flip for it. For some reason. Yeah, like, and, I, it, and it jumps. If you watch the scenes, it just jumps I mean, back whatever. You know what? You know, you watch, like, a Scorsese movie, and, like, him and Thelma Schoonmaker, they cut that thing within an inch of its life so that there's lots of jump cuts that don't make sense. The continuity doesn't make sense, but it's there. <laughs> it works. And, like, that's George's of the same generation, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who's gone back and redone his movies multiple times. <laughs> same generation. See, he, well, he is part of the same generation. He is, but, he is. Um, and they're friends. Uh, we're friendly, anyway. Yeah, um, they are. So, yeah. Uh, and you know, hey, Marty's getting into the big, the big guy uh, making actors young. The big visual effects game. I wonder if him and George have talked at all about that. I, I, bet, I bet he has because I I saw this article that. Like, by the way, Martin Scorsese is directing a movie called The Irishman, where Bobby De Niro and and Alfred Pacino are de aged yes. for large think, chunks. I of the think movie. Pesci is too. Pesci, be, yeah. yeah, Joe Pesci is going to be the hardest one. I feel like. <laughs> And like, like that man has transformed into a little like ball. He, and like he, <laughs> he, he like said something in an interview that like he it's like he finds it that it's been the hardest part of the movie because he's been such a stickler because he's known these guys for years and so, like he wants yeah. them to look exactly how he remembers. He did them. an interview like with where he was interviewing uh, this director uh, Joanna Hogg who has a new movie called The Souvenir that's out. This is getting some deep film dork <laughs> shit on our Star Wars podcast, but hey, and uh, and they they had a, like a the A twenty four podcast. I think they talked and like great podcast, and he talked a little bit about the Irishman and how it's like maddening apparently. But anyway, <laughs> uh, like the effect, like and he talked about because they met when he was making Hugo mm-hmm. him and this director. And oh. uh, and he was like Hugo is he was, like he's like he's like it was a fun picture to make, but it was very difficult, you, very very difficult. You want to? 
it's it, funny you brought up Hugo. I was on my Roku the other day, and I have this channel called Pluto, which is just a free free channel. movies. And stuff. Yeah, I open it. Hugo was on, and it's the scene where they're watching from Earth to the Moon. Yeah, and I started crying. That movie's great. That scene. That movie is amazing. Right, right, and, and like you know, we're talking about like Martin Scorsese on our Star Wars podcast, but. Um, I actually think most Star Wars fans would probably really like Hugo. You should yeah. check out Hugo. It's a lot Hugo of fun. Hugo rules. Um, and the book's good, too. The Invention of Hugo Cabret. And he also called the movie that, by the way. He was clearly pissed that they changed the title. Anyway. Anyway. Any any further remarks on watching? It was this? a lot of fun. Uh, shout out to my brother. Shout out to my friend Chris. My friend Michelle. Michelle, uh, you need to come on this podcast. You love the Jedi Apprentice books. Uh, I'm just calling her out right now. <laughs> Blast her non-existent social media. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so anyway, but uh, it, it was a lot of fun. It was a good day. We got pizza for lunch and we got Chinese for dinner because we were there all day. It's a good day. So it was all a good time. And uh, Now, I would maybe... Uh, uh, tease this idea. Would you ever be interested in doing the movies with all the new movies? Would you watch if we did some special thing for the podcast? Okay, maybe because yeah. I that's a long sit. That's a long sit, and the ga- you break that gap in between Sith and A New Hope with uh, Han You're, Solo. I'm including the spinoffs. Yeah, too. of course. Okay. So oh, you my. you have put Solo in there. Well, because Rogue One. Ends no, it's, right on A New Hope. It so. would be good, yeah. And I mean, I guess we'll have three years before there's another one. So then we're we're stuck at uh, what it would be eleven movies, and, yeah. or, or would we include the Clone Wars I, movie? We should include the Clone Wars movie. You should include all of Clone Wars. <laughs> all of Clo- and, okay. Then this becomes a week long. And, and the Mandalorian and the Cassian Andor Jeez, show. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's a ridiculous. Thing to do. Rebels, you have to include Rebels. Rebels is great. Um, we're gonna we, we'll do some Rebels content at some point. There's a lot of Rebels stuff, right? Um, Actually, original Rebels content, whereas a lot of the Clone Wars stuff is just yeah. We're probably not going to do a lot of the Clone Wars books because they're just adaptations of episodes. But so. uh, Rebels, there's a whole like original like series of books about a side character in Rebels. Um, so when you get to Rebels, once you're done watching Clone Wars and you watch Rebels. Then we'll probably cover that stuff. Uh, but anyway, it was a fun time. I'm glad you had a good time. Uh, I, know, didn't, I never doubted it for I a saw, second. I, I see a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, when Rise of Skywalker comes out, I'm going to watch all the movies. It's like, I'm not going to do that. I'll watch Force Awakens. And yep, Jedi. same. To me, I'm like, it needs to satisfy me as an ending to that trilogy. Mm-hmm. It's not going to satisfy me as an ending to the whole saga. This nonsense needs to stop. Yeah. It's not the end of the whole saga. Okay. The only way... The only way... It's let's be honest. That movie has to end with a series of Force ghosts showing up in the final scene, as Return of the Jedi does, right? Like oh, I, I want to see Ewan. I want to see Hayden. I want to see Yoda. Le- Liam Neeson. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. At least hear him because he doesn't actually have bodily form, according to Clone Wars. But you could get his voice in there. He did a voice on Clone Wars, right? He'll be back. So He'll yeah, we back. get it. We'll get all of them. All of them back. Mace. Kit Fisto, Yadi Mundi, Plo Koon. Yeah. You know Plo Yaddle's will be there. Yaddle's gotta be there. <laughs> Yaddle's gotta be there. So with that... Disney contradicts the Blu-ray cut of episode one by including Yaddle, since he yes. removed Yaddle. Um, and it's interesting, I meant... I'll go back to this briefly, the Han Greedo thing. I noticed when you posted uh, the pictures on our Instagram, one of our listeners, or somebody on the Instagram anyway, commented... Saying hashtag Greedo shot first. Mm-hmm. I assume that's just a support of George in general, and not just an actual support of that choice because it's a silly. Come on, guys, is anybody actually like that's good? You know, Does anybody actually think that's like good? I don't care. I don't care as much as the people that are really mad about it. It doesn't bother me in the mm-hmm. same way. But it's a kind of stupid. I but, know. I, <laughs> I know who that person is, and that person is my brother. Oh, really? Yeah, really? Yeah. And he, like, he called me the next day, and he was like, yo, did you see my comment on that on your Instagram post? That Greedo shot first. Wasn't that funny? And I was like... I mean, it is kind yeah, of funny. Yeah. I just, well, I was expecting it was someone that... Anyway, whatever. It, We've been talking. It would be funny to actually get my brother on this show, because he ingests... He ingests 
all his knowledge of Star Wars from just online Wikipedia and stuff like that. And he seems to be a... Uh, he doesn't. I know he doesn't care for Last Jedi, even though he's only seen Last Jedi once. You can't say you didn't like Last Jedi if you only seen the movie once. Get out of my face oh, well, if you've yeah. only seen it once. <laughs> also, I want to make one thing about. I, I like critiquing your social media presence for the show <laughs> on the show. You uh, made a Watson Wednesday post yeah. with a picture of Jude Watson, and you said if you don't know who Jude Watson is. You're not a real Star Wars fan? I don't want to be in the business of talking about who's a real Star Wars fan or not. That's not the kind of show we are. We like everybody. Yes. We want people to enjoy Jude Watson, of course. But, like, you know. I guess. I, should, I, I shouldn't be so... Uh, uh, so uh, it's fine. I, yes. you know, it's I, I, I'm just saying be mindful. I see, of I see your concern. I, be mindful of it. Anyway, we're going to be mindful of the time. Of the, of the, the <laughs> runtime of the show. And... Uh, we're going to take a break, and we'll be back to talk about Jedi Apprentice number 11, The Deadly Hunter. Den's stare burned a hole through Andra's forehead. Why did this woman with whom he'd had so much conflict inspire such burning desire in him? So much more than the desire for her company, or desire to touch her. No. This was the desire to fuck. Tim, it's time to record! Oh, coming, Levi! Welcome back to Padawan Library. This week, we continue Jedi Apprentice number 11, The Deadly Hunter, Jude Watson. All the elements are there. Before we get started, Mm -hmm. there is something interesting at the beginning of this book. There's a dedication, which uh, has never appeared before in a Star Wars, in one of these books, and it says, Heartfelt thanks to Jane Mason and Sarah Hines Stevens for their contribution to Jedi Apprentice. Now, you looked up some information yes, here, and this is interesting because I'll say what my speculation is. Yeah, so these two write books together... And um, I know, I can't remember which one of them. One of them has recently started her own book series. But when these two wrote books together, it was for Scholastic, who put out these books. And some of the series they wrote are the A Dog and His Girl Mysteries, the Candy Apple book series, the Princess School book series, and the Nickelodeon's Zoe 101 book series. So they worked at Scholastic with Jude about this time. So yeah, my speculation, and I don't know if you found any concrete information on this, but my speculation is that a lot of long-running young reader series that are on a very tight schedule, they have one head writer Mm -hmm. who kind of plots out the series, and occasionally for less important books, they farm out the writing, the actual writing of the book to another writer. My guess is these are probably writers like that. Right. Um, uh, but I don't know if you found any actual info I on didn't. That. I didn't get any further than Maybe that. Maybe something to ask Jude if we ever get to interview yeah, her. Yeah, because, and you said something to me earlier that you wonder, because our last two books have been very standalone stories, and felt like they were lacking something that this book and maybe had. my guess is that maybe jude because this book we'll get into it it's clearly starting a new story arc yes maybe jude was planning the story arc and like needed a little extra time it was just like hey why don't you guys write uh some books to come out in the meantime that are just standalone adventures mm-hmm. i don't know if that's the case this is pure speculation yeah. But uh but like, seems likely. Because like in Especially for the timing of this. Especially in the Shattered Piece too, the the jump, the third act twist of what's his face was the one who kidnapped his brother, it made almost no sense. There was no precursor to this happening. And the only other really weird plot hole we've ever encountered with Jude is in book two. The, what is that, the Dark Rival? Yeah. Where, like, Obi-Wan's going to sacrifice himself, and then they find this kind of very quick way out of that. That's the only, like, real glaring... It's, like, not, even a, it's not a plot hole, it's just, it's very convenient. Yes, um, and, but... I, I think, uh, and I mean, that's her first one, too. Uh, and, I, you know, I've always thought it was a little silly that they would... That these, and this isn't just limited, like, the Animorphs books, like, mm-hmm. Kay Applegate is the main author of those books... But there are a few ghostwriters that wrote some of them mm-hmm. here and there. 
I always thought it was a little silly. It's like you could always put created by K.A. Applegate and then this mm-hmm. book is written by this person. And I wonder if that's more the norm now because, like, I know, like, that 39 Step series that Jude writes for, they get credit. Right. Individual rights. authors. I mean, this yeah. was years ago at this point, but you know what I mean. So maybe that's less of a common practice now, but it was a common practice. So my guess is that's who uh, Jane Mason and Sarah Hines Stevens are. And not only does this book establish an arc, but this has new characters that I like. I mm-hmm. like the new characters in this book. It has, and it has a humor to it that I feel like was missing from the last. Two I books. do think the previous book. I think I said on the last episode that it's my least favorite Jedi Apprentice mm-hmm. book, and it is. But I will say, I think that book is relatively fine until the ending. I think the ending really undermines that book totally, with the brother being the bad guy and then being immediately forgiven in such a strange fashion but uh, <laughs> and then we don't allowed to be a tyrant like continue this this yeah. tyrannical reign <laughs> it's like. baffling uh, <laughs> it's the least politically uh clear yes uh it's... book in the series uh but let's not reiterate that go back to last week if you want to hear about that and uh <laughs> this week we are on the deadly hunter and this is a this is a short one uh, it but is. it's a good one, I think. Well, to spoil my thoughts a little bit, it's good. I like this book. So, starting off, chapter one, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, they're returning to Coruscant after a long journey. And I guess that's the long journey where those standalone adventures happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, just as Obi-Wan's like, about to catch, he's basically about to catch like a cab back to the Jedi Temple, Qui-Gon holds him back. It's like, hey, why don't you come with me and meet a friend of mine? And uh, he takes him to meet Didi Odo, who is a mover and shaker on Coruscant. And I mentioned a character earlier. We'll talk about this in a minute. <laughs> Let me finish yes. this. Anyway, he's a mover and shaker on Coruscant, and he like apparently offers... He's a source of information often for the Jedi. He sells information. And uh, he seems to know everybody. He runs a cafe. Interesting. Mm-hmm. A cafe. And uh, the cafe is apparently, according to Obi-Wan at least, very junky and gross. Just, is a mess. And uh, they get to the bar in the back, and that's where Dee Dee greets Qui-Gon very warmly, gives him a hug. He's a little short man. <laughs> is he a human? I think, I think he's human, okay. yeah. Okay. So he greets him very warmly, hugs him, Qui-Gon hum- hugs him right back, and uh, this shocks Obi-Wan. He's seen Qui-Gon so- with so much emotion, so much caring towards another person he's like what is happening and so uh anyway uh Qui-Gon's like well at, um place looks a lot nicer and this shocks Obi-Wan Obi-Wan's like what are you talking about this is disgusting basically and uh apparently there's all the work of de- the the nicening up of the place whatever that means is the work of Dee Dee's daughter Astri. And uh, Dee Dee uh, wants to take... But Dee Dee's like, okay, kid, I want to take you aside. My boy Qui-Gon, come with me. We need to discuss something serious. He says, I am afraid. Danger stalks me. I need your help. One thing I do want to point out is this book established on like the first page that Obi-Wan is 14 years old. Yes. He turned 13 in The Hidden Past, so, so we're, we're a year away from The, the Hidden that's Past. That's good, because like, if we move at the same rate, he's only going to be like 15 by the end of the series, yeah, right. and I think he's supposed to be like 24 yeah, in he's pretty Phantom, old Menace. In Phantom Menace. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot, lot of dead time there. They should bring Jude back, yeah. let her write some more books. Um, anyway, uh, I do want to say one thing before you get on to the next chapter. Uh, the character of Dee Dee... At least in terms of his role. Oh my, if you could hear that, I'm not sure. That, <laughs> yeah. Big thunderstorm happening here in Erie, PA, guys. Um, but anyway, uh, his, in terms of his role, I think Dee Dee reminds me a lot of a character who's mm-hmm. introduced. About, this book came out in the year 2000, and about two years later, a film called Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones came out featuring a character named Dexter Jetson, yes. who offers a lot of information, runs a cafe, yep. offers a lot of information to... Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's, anything on toward happened. Or, I just think it's... I, I'm glad... It's like... The, the Coruscant's full of these kinds of mm-hmm. people. And uh, I love Dexter. And I love Dee Dee. And you know what? It's funny you mention this. 
because I just searched DD on on Wikipedia. I want to going to say this. This is not the last time we will see uh, DD uh, DD in Odo, a book. Yeah. DD Odo. And uh, I just had a spoiler, so I'm going to click out oh, of this. Oh, get out of here. Um, but I will say this. I know in the last of the Jedi series, Dexter Jester is on one of the covers, or at least one of his species, but I'm pretty sure it's Dexter Jester is on one of the covers of those books. Oh, well. So, we'll so, get to that next so, spring, so guys. Jude may tackle this similarity between these two characters. Maybe next summer. I'm not sure exactly <laughs> when that's happening. Probably spring. Yes. Uh, anyway, so uh, moving on. Chapter okay, two. so Dee Dee's like, only two days ago, I was almost kidnapped. And he tells them that a humanoid woman in plastoid armor came after him on a swoop. Not a speeder. Know the difference. Um, <laughs> and she used some kind of whip that she wrapped around his body and she was dragging him towards her. However, when she used her whip, she knocked the visor off a cav uh, A cav... Rihu is a, actually not a species. It's actually a pirate. The Kavrihu pirates are human pirates first seen in Timothy Zahn's Dark Force Rising. Oh. Yes, and he was apparently standing nearby. <sighs> okay. And uh, there's a and uh, he chases after this about uh, uh, character on the swoop with a large vibro blade. So she gives up trying to catch Dee Dee, and uh, she ends up fighting the other guy. So Dee Dee gets away. Qui-Gon then asked, who is she? And uh, and this is where it gets interesting, because Dee Dee, a man who can get knowledge very easily, he says, well, she's an enigma. No one knows her name or her home world. All I know is where she's staying. So he knows what hotel she's staying at. So uh, Qui-Gon questions, well, why is a bounty hunter after you? And Dee Dee's like, I'm innocent. I'm innocent of all crimes. Uh, but uh, uh, he may have once or twice bought provisions on the black market or placed a couple <laughs> bets. Um, but who hasn't? Come on, man. Um, but he thinks that perhaps another planet's government has mistaken him for someone else. And uh, this is just all a big mix-up. So... Obi-Wan's not buying it. Qui-Gon notices that Obi-Wan's not buying it. Uh, but uh, Obi-Wan is always quick to judge people based on their skeeziness, for example, then. And, uh, and Elon, so and, he's back yeah, now. Okay. Yes. Uh, but uh, Obi doesn't know yet that Dee Dee has a generous heart and that Obi-Wan needs to look below the surface before he judges people. And perhaps he'll learn that in this book. Um, Dee Dee asks Qui-Gon uh, if he could go visit the bounty hunter and clear this whole thing up. And I have something here marked on page 10. I don't know if it's worth reading or not. I haven't. Um, let's see here. Okay. I'll read for Dee Dee, you read for Qui-Gon. I'm going to start at, I know where she's staying. Okay. I know where she's staying. An inn not far from here, Dee Dee said rapidly. You could go there right now. For a Jedi, this is a tiny favor. It'll only take you five minutes of your time. So easy for one as wise and as strong as yourself. She cannot ignore a Jedi. You know I, I love your person, Qui-Gon, and I would never endanger you. Your life must be long, for I value you so... Qui-Gon's eyes twinkled. Ah, I see. I must live a long life for your sake, Dee Dee. Ha! <laughs> you are so clever, too. Jedi wisdom. It catches me every time. Uh, of course, I didn't mean you should live long for only me, Dee Dee said hurriedly. Me only? <laughs> oh, me only. <laughs> Dee Dee said hurriedly. <laughs> so many depend on you, like your Padawan here. Is that not right, Obi-Wan? Obi-Wan did not look pleased to be dragged into Dee Dee's coaxing. Excuse me, Dee Dee, he said, but if you're innocent of any charge, why can't you see the bounty hunter yourself? Ask her to do a retinal scan or check your identification papers. The matter can be cleared up in seconds. Oh, that, that is a very good plan, were I not such a cowardly person, <laughs> Dee Dee told Obi-Wan earnestly. He turned back to Qui-Gon. You see how he worships you? Just as I do. You question my love for you and it hurts me. Dee Dee dapped his eyes with a napkin. He swooped up from a stack on his desk. All right, Dee Dee, Qui-Gon said, bemused. 
You can stop all this drama. I will see your bounty hunter. I, this, I love this scene. Is that you got classic Jude humor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they leave and Obi-Wan's like, do you really buy this story? And uh, on page 12 here, I'm just going to read this. This is a Qui-Gon thing. Um, uh, okay, this is actually something Obi-Wan says. It seems to me that you are involving us as something that is bound to be dangerous and of in, is of none of the Jedi's concern. Here is a man who seeks out criminals and dregs of the galaxy in order to <laughs> gather information in which he sells to the highest bidder. Uh, if you live in that sort of world, you deserve whatever bad luck comes your way. See, Obi-Wan had a lot to learn. <laughs> I he doesn't that. understand about systemic... Uh, oppression, yeah, and about the, the 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 worlds people are born into and 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 designed to be kept there by uh, by by uh, the, by the bureaucracy of uh, 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 you know often racist or classist bureaucracy. He doesn't understand this. No, he doesn't. He needs to learn. He's but so- a lot of a lot of idealistic fourteen year olds feel this way, and uh, and uh, hopefully they learn. Many of the the rest of them all become YouTubers. This um. This uh, this uh, use of the term drag made me laugh because this is a word that I recently heard for the first time. Oh really? And, um, Come on! I was at the my, I was at my uh, my parents' house and my dad was watching the Bruce Willis movie, The Last Boy Scout. Oh, that's a fun yeah, movie. Yeah, it was. And he goes Shane Black. I think yeah, wrote that, right? Uh, yeah. And my dad goes that uh, that Bruce Willis. He's such a drag. And I'm oh, like, I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah, that I've never heard. Your dad. <laughs> You might have coined that, um, but you know, probably not actually. Yeah. I just, but I have not heard that version. But the dregs of society, I've heard. Yes, um, but anyway, uh, Qui Gon's like, well, it's because he's my friend. That's why he's going to help him. So. Good, good. So Qui Gon, Obi Wan, they arrive at the Soft Landings Inn, which is where the bounty hunter uh, is staying, and uh, Qui Gon informs. Uh, the Targaryen at the desk uh, that who he's looking for, and he's pointed to the third floor. Qui-Gon knocks on the door of the bill of the room, explains who he is and why he's there, and then after a bit of a pause, you know, the door slides open, and this lady begins a staring contest with Qui-Gon. She's there. She's in armor. She's got like a little visor. Type thing, and she's her and Qui Gon are staring each other down, and Obi Wan is blown away by the test of wills happening here. This is something that <laughs> Obi Wan's always blown away by by the will of Qui Gon Jinn, and um, so, uh, but eventually she tires of this. She pulls out a whip and engages the Jedi in combat, and they both get nicked here or there. And the whip, by the way, is is, a, is like a bladed whip, but it also has a laser form. Um, and she uh, escapes, though. She kind of jumps into the wall and is like turns into like a kind of Samus style uh, little ball, like Metroid. Mm-hmm. And um, and then she slides through a crack in the door, like T one thousand style. <laughs> and it's like, what is going on here? What kind of creature could she be? Is she boneless? Boneless creature? A boneless person? Boneless? Boneless? Anyway. And, uh... Just the, and the mixing of your sci-fi references there, too. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, anyway, so Qui-Gon uh, has, you know, some vaguely serious cut on his back. And he tells Obi-Wan, don't worry... Uh, but anyway, so they must return to tell Dee Dee, uh, that the bad news and Obi-Wan rolls his eyes. He doesn't actually roll his eyes, but he's like, oh, we have to go here. Yeah. Complaining again as per usual. So, uh, I just want to say this was the, this is a very cool, creepy chapter that was like the way she just sits there and. Oh, for like, sure. It's a, <laughs> you know, I talked about the contest of wills, but there's actually like a eeriness to this character, this bounty hunter character. Mm-hmm. Um, for uh, sure. Anyway, chapter four, they go back to Dee Dee's and request a med pack. Uh, since Dee Dee is so highly unorganized, he can't find one in the mess of his desk. So Qui-Gon's like, Obi-Wan, just grab ours. So Obi-Wan does it, and Obi-Wan's about to dress Qui-Gon's wound, 
and uh, Dee Dee pushes him out of the way and he starts dressing the wound and this is where Obi-Wan's surprised by Dee Dee because Dee Dee is doing such a good job as a healer his hands, his little hands are so nimble um, so as this is going on Qui-Gon starts to press Dee Dee again you know, why does somebody want you dead? And uh, Obi-Wan suggests this may not be a warrant job, but instead like a private commission. Somebody particular wants you dead. And uh, Qui-Gon, he's like, oh, I like that idea. And he says, you know, come I on. I like that idea. Yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> I paraphrase a lot. Oh, and, of course. And he's like, come on, Dee Dee. You buy, sell, and trade secrets. You've had to have pissed someone off. Dee Dee's like, no, no, I didn't do it. Um, so Qui-Gon, he's like, all right, I better uh, calm tall and see what I can find out. And uh, Obi-Wan's like, oh, man, you're going to involve the Jedi in this? Now we have no business. And Qui-Gon's like, it's cool. Tall is Dee Dee's friend, too. Oh, yes. interesting. Uh-huh. Tall. Uh-huh. Tall. Tall. Hmm. Bounce chicken. Wow, wow. Uh, he, so he calls Tall, and he describes the bounty hunter, and she already exactly knows who he's talking about, because this bounty hunter... Because they have a connection. Yes. Quite exactly. on and yeah. Tall. Oh, you yes. I mean? that, that, that connection. There's a connection uh-huh. there. And it's this, a lot like maybe two other characters that we know. <laughs> Dan. <laughs> And yes, Dendra. Dendra. <laughs> <laughs> that should somehow be a sketch. We need to do Dendra as a sketch somehow. Um, <laughs> we'll figure something. Out. Yeah. Um, Maybe so, when they show up again in the special edition. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this bounty hunter has the ability to kill and disappear. And this uh, uh, has caught the attention of Yoda. And uh, so he assigned Tall to gather info. She doesn't have a name because no one knows her name. And she's known for taking any bounty, regardless of how dangerous or high risk it is, especially if the price is right. Tall had, had no idea that this bounty hunter was even on Coruscant. That's all she knows. So uh, she tells them to be careful, and uh, Yoda's expecting you guys back at the temple soon. Oh. So we'll see you when you get here. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Better be home in time for dinner. Yeah. Qui-Gon. So uh, he, Qui-Gon again presses Dee Dee, and there's a joke here on page twenty-four. And did you mention the fact that Ashtray had painted the window sills when they show up at the diner? Um, yeah, uh, first thing Qui Gon notices is the fact that remembers Dee Dee's daughter. Yes, and Qui Gon notices that the window sills have been freshly painted. So, the question is, Qui Gon interrupted, ignoring Dee Dee, why would such a high priced killer be hired to take care of a low level scounger like Dee Dee? Dee Dee sat erect. Low level? Just a minute. I resent that characterization. Haven't you noticed that we painted the window sills <laughs> as far as scrounging? So that was the joke that I thought was very funny on that page. Yes. Oh, man. S- scrounger. <laughs> Scr- that's an interesting term. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, it makes sense, but still. Anyway. Uh, hang on. That's not the end of this chapter. I know it's not. I know. Oh, what did you have to say then? No, oh, I don't have anything. Okay. I'm saying let, you can continue. Yeah. This is a long chapter. Lots of going on. Um, so, uh, Dee Dee does recall two pieces of information he recently acquired from a character named Fly. The first is Senator Utsa Sorn uh, from Belasco is resigning. The second piece of information is that the Tech Raiders are moving their headquarters to Vandor 3. Both things don't seem all that bad, but Qui-Gon thinks, well, we better investigate them both. So just then, uh, Dee Dee da- Dee Dee's daughter, Ashtree, the windowsill painter, burst into the room with a big pot of soup. And something else Qui-Gon told Obi-Wan at the beginning of this book is, whatever you do... Don't eat any of the food at Dee Dee's diner. <laughs> so Ashtray burst in with this big pot of soup and she shoves a spoonful of it in Obi-Wan's face. And she's like, here, taste this. He looks over at Qui-Gon and then she like practically force feeds him it to him. And he has no choice. But to his surprise, it's good. He likes it. There you go. So, or so he claims. Yes. So she notices Qui-Gon. She excitedly sets down the pot. Soup goes everywhere. It's a huge mess. She's a bit of a klutz. 
a little clumsy like someone else I know, a certain Ophi one. <laughs> and, uh, um, and maybe Obi Wan should take note of his oafish nature. Yes, um, she's unaware of what's going on with this bounty hunter, and Dee Dee wants it to stay that way. Um, she wants her father to be done with all this shady business. She wants to turn the diner into a classy joint. And uh, she informs them that there's a big medical convention coming to town, and this uh, famed. Uh, uh, Jenna Zan Arbor, who famously invented this vaccine for a deadly virus, she booked a whole party at Dee Dee's diner, and uh, and yeah, so she needs money for tablecloths and all this stuff. So she leaves. Dee Dee grumbles about money, and this is when oh, the Jedi decide to leave, investigate the potential leads, and when Qui Gon tells Obi Wan this. He's like, come on, we have to go back to the temple. Yoda's expecting us. And Qui-Gon says, it's okay. Yoda will understand because he's a friend of Dee Dee's. Oh, <laughs> yes. Dee Dee is popular with Jedi. He's like the cool guy. Yeah, for sure. You know, the Jedi, they're all, you know. They love him. So, chapter five. Uh, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, they head over to the Senate offices to find Fly, uh, who is... The informant who provided Dee Dee with the two recent pieces of intel. And uh, Fly is eating at a cafe in the office building. He's drinking Muha juice, Muja juice. We, we, we never settled on a pronunciation there. We, it, it, that's come up before, I feel yeah. like. But, you know, whatever. He is a, he's a spindly and long, long-faced man. Big ears. Uh... <laughs> One prosthetic green eye. This this factor is pretty significantly. I have I have a little. I have my fingers closed into a loop over my eye right now. <laughs> for those of you who are listening and not in the room, uh, so <laughs> um, theater of the mind. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, hey man, you know that's what it is. It's, it's the it's the great art form, the great lost art form. Tim's is, also wearing no pants right now. Oh, hey now, hey now, I mean, hey now. Well, I'm wearing I'm wearing gym shorts. That's, <laughs> Let's hear it. Okay. Uh, you know, you can't be putting that out there about people. So, um, anyway, Qui-Gon asks Fly uh, where he heard the information, where he heard the information about the Tech Raiders and Senator Sorn. And the Tech Raiders stuff, you know, after some cajoling, he convinces them. And the Tech Raiders stuff, he heard from their representative on Coruscant, who is named Helb. And interestingly, well, he's going to appear. Helb will appear, but Helb is of a... A certain species. A species but... that we're big fans of. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway. And uh, he, heard th- he heard this from, from Helb at the Splendor Tavern, which is apparently where the seedier information is dealt these days now that Astri has kind of cleaned up Dee Dee's act a little bit. The Senator Sorn information about her retiring, that came from a private memo that uh, went out um, and he just leaked it. So, uh, Fly, uh, he loves Dee Dee, and so he kind of wanly offers his help. Uh, but will it be reliable help? We don't know. So, before leaving, they do visit Senator Soren's office. Uh, and uh, they inform her that the info about her retirement is out there. And she's like, immediately, oh, oh fuck. Uh, and uh, she says, I'm sponsoring a piece of legislation in two days. It won't get any support if it's known that I'm retiring. And uh, should she? And then she's like, ah, should I immediately announce the news so that, you know, uh, maybe it'll, I can make a legacy play. They'll be, you know, but um, he, she thanks them and they leave basically immediately. And then there's an interesting bit here on page 37. Um, and, uh, why don't you start with, there's a Obi-Wan bit here, um, about halfway down, it says, why didn't you ask her about Dee Dee? And this is Obi-Wan. Talking. Okay. Why didn't you ask her about Dee Dee? He asked Qui-Gon. Because it wouldn't have gotten me anywhere. If she put a death mark on Dee Dee's head, she would hardly admit it, Qui-Gon said. And I can't see how she would trace the theft of, of the data pad to Dee Dee. Do you? Only if she's lying, Obi-Wan said after a moment. If she'd seen Fly steal it, it would have been easy to trace to him, to Dee Dee. But why go after Dee Dee and not Fly? Obi-Wan thought this over some more. He felt a he felt at a disadvantage. Qui-Gon seemed to have an insight into the hearts and minds of beings that he did not. 
Uh, oh, still, Senator Soren's distress seemed sincere to me, he said slowly. She was barely polite and not terribly nice, but not evil, just busy. A typical senator, Qui-Gon said with half a smile. She seemed surprised that the information was out, Obi-Wan said. Yes, she did, Qui-Gon mused, unless she is a very good actress. But she did seem sincerely upset. Why did Fly tell us that an assistant got... Why did Fly tell us that an assistant got the announcement out of the trash? Obi-Wan asked. It's obviously not true. He didn't actually say that, Padawan, Qui-Gon said. He just indicated that as one of many ways he could have gotten the information. No, Fly stole the data pad. He would not want to admit that to us, however. This seems like a dead end to me, Obi-Wan said in conclusion. Senator Soren is certainly doesn't look like a murderer. Qui-Gon's blue eyes were keen. Tell me, Padawan, what does a murderer look like? <laughs> so, interesting stuff. So they uh, leave the Senate and head towards the Splendor Tavern. Qui-Gon knows exactly where it's at. Why? Of course he does. Because he's been there before. It's where you go if you need a connection on the black market. So this takes them into the lower seat. They were tall and you know, went, went out there one time. They had a, I mean. sp- a splendor at that tavern. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> so this takes them to the lower levels of Coruscant. The seedy levels. The parts Obi-Wan that has never been to before. And the Splendor Tavern is a hole-in-the-wall shack. And... Uh, uh, they go inside, there's blaring music, shady creatures, gambling, drinking, everybody's having a good time. They even witness the bartender, a Togren, smack a guy who goes flying across the room. So, uh, suddenly, uh, because of this, Obi-Wan has a change of heart. Dee Dee's place isn't that bad. Um, so, uh, Qui-Gon goes, talks to the bartender, and he points them into the direction of a... Nomoidian sitting in the corner. So this is the first time a Nomoidian, one of our favorite species, has ever showed up in this book series. Uh, this oh, this is an interesting thing. I have to point this out. Hmm. There's a Nomoidian in <laughs> Revenge of the Sith who has like kind of a SoCal surfer dude accent. You mentioned this to me while you were watching <laughs> this, and I'm unsure who you're talking it's about. It's like when... Uh, it's like it's the guy that's like first there when Anakin shows up. I... I wish I had written down the lines, <laughs> but next time you're watching Sith, just listen out for some Nomoidian accents that you might not have heard before, man. <laughs> I will. So this Nomoidian <laughs> is uh, Helb, and he's a member of the Tech Raiders. And uh, when he Qui-Gon asks about the price on Didi's head, uh, Helb says, yeah, I'm mad at Didi because he beat me at Sabacc last week, but not mad enough to kill the man. He beat me at Sabacc last <laughs> week, man. <laughs> That's his voice. <laughs> if we have to do hell voices in a sketch, that, that will be his voice. That's good. I like that. <laughs> um, so, uh, if he was going to have anybody killed, it would be Fly, because Fly owes the tech raiders a whole lot of money and uh, men- for many, many favors. So, uh, Qui-Gon brings up the info about the tech union moving their base and uh, uh, Helb is like, I wanted that to get out, man. How else are we supposed to attract customers if they don't know where our base is? That kind of fell apart there. That at the sounds end. like a weird British thing. I right won't there. do that again. Um, so, uh, but, uh, and then Helb's like, but you know, if you need any sort of uh, tech merchandise at the temple, let us know. And Qui-Gon's like, not a, but thanks. Uh, so they make their way towards the door, and Obi-Wan notices an old man wearing tattered robes. There's something about this old man, something familiar. And as they're walking out the door, he turns back at the last moment and notices that the old man is shedding his robes and is running out the back. And it's not an old man anymore, but the f- humanoid female bounty hunter, the bounty hunter with no name, it's... In a dis- she's in a disguise, so they chase after her. Could she be the Mandalorian? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she is. They're going very man with no name. Man. Yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, so they lose her in an alley, and now the question is: Was it coincidence that she was there, or is she following them? So Obi Wan and Qui Gon they head back to Dee Dee's cafe. They're running, and Astri is uh, nervous about the imminent Jenna Zan Arbor party. 
uh, and Fly was supposed to help her clean up, but never showed up. This is interesting. Anyway, so Jenna Zan Arbor, she shows up with her party, looks baffled and disappointed by the shabbiness of the establishment. And uh, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, they, they head right to the back to visit with Dee Dee, and Dee Dee's crying. And he talks about, he keeps saying, I fear it is my fault. I fear it is my fault. And they're like, what? What's happening? And Fly has been murdered. Oh. Um, so uh, the, uh, the Jedi go to the crime scene. Yes. And I'm going to just read this first little bit here. Obi-Wan had faced death before. He never got used to it. The way a spirit could fill a space, the life energy behind the eyes. And then, nothing. Oh. That, Love it. That's great. This is what we come to these books for. So, uh, it is. It is. It is. This is why we love Jude Watson. We celebrate her. This is why I attacked. <laughs> you attacked all Star Wars fans <laughs> who haven't read this relatively footnote esque element of this franchise. Well, she's written forty four. She's Star great. Wars books. I love her. I'm just saying. It's reasonable that some fans I, might miss her, including it's, you. Yes, extremely and, and, reasonable. I mean, I only read yeah. one of them when I was a child. That's true. That is very, very true. So there you go. Anyway, so it was the course on security that called Dee Dee. Uh, Fly's body had been found in an alleyway near the Senate, and uh, uh, Dee Dee is wondering if this murder had anything to do with him, and, and Qui Gon believes it has. Uh, so uh, they. Uh, Oh, I guess they're not there yet. Um, he wants Dee Dee to come with them uh, to go visit the body, um, but because uh, he doesn't want Dee Dee out of his sights, and Dee Dee's like, "No, no, no, it's fine. I'm gonna lock the place up. I've already made sure the windows are checked. Um, I'll be safe here because this party's going on right now." And uh, he says, "Just tell the security forces there the funeral cost. I got it. Funerals on Dee Dee, you know." Oh. So they show Props up, to Dee Dee. Yes. They show Good up, friend. They show up at the crime scene, and uh, uh, the Jedi, apparently, it's law on Coruscant that uh, at a crime scene, the Jedi can just walk up and have a look-see. It's, See, this <laughs> is a problem. This is part of what led to the fall of the Jedi. In fact, they're so intertwined with, with government and the police, it's like... Your your religious order focus on your spirituality yeah, and, right. and, and helping others. The, the altruism you don't need. You know this this is this is what leads. Yeah. This is the path to the dark side. So uh, they deal with this disinterested captain. You can't deal with cops, Come on. right? I know this is not. This should not be official Jedi business. I love that term Jedi business in Attack of the Clones. That do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? <laughs> 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 so uh, Obi-Wan stays on the sides uh, Apparently Fly was strangled with a cord And then his body was drained of all its blood And he was killed somewhere else And thrown in the alleyway afterwards um, And then the captain informs him That there has been a string of unsolved murders Done this exact same way So was Fly another random victor Of a Star Wars Jack the Ripper Or was this a copycat um, <laughs> Obi Wan, he sees something glitter in the shadows, and he looks, and it's Fly's prosthetic green eye. Whoa! Yeah, that came back. You know, it's right there. Yep, right there. It's it's, it's over my eye again. <laughs> my hand is over my eye for the listeners, for those of you who can't see me, which is all yes. of you. The theater of the mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, from here, they're just like, all right, let's go check on the inn again. I want to have another word with our bounty hunter. So they get to the inn, and they discover that she is checked out. So they head for Dee Dee's, and when they get there, there's no lights on in the windows. We're too late, Qui-Gon says. Oh, man. So Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, they rush headlong into Dee Dee's cafe. It's empty. Dee Dee's office is overturned empty. They rush up to Dee Dee's private quarters. Astri is unconscious on the floor. Dee Dee is in the grip of... I say this, 
He's in the grip of the whip. So, yeah, Dee Dee's in the grip of the whip, and uh, Qui Gon attacks. Uh, you know, manages to get Dee Dee free of the whip, but uh, the bounty hunter escapes immediately. Astri wakes up. Which is a relief. Dee Dee fesses up um, to her about the fact that there's a bounty hunter on his trail. And uh, and he also admits that he's returned to selling information. This, of course, pisses her off. She's like, what the hell? Anyway, Jenna Zan Arbor, she, she uh, Astri talks about how Je- Jenna Zan Arbor had thrown a fit and left the place in a huff. Astri doesn't remember the rest of the night until she was knocked out, though. Um, so, Qui-Gon insists Dee Dee and Astri must go into hiding off-world. Not off-world, just off the planet. Uh, not the off-world mining corporation. Uh, anyway, so, uh, Dee Dee owns a house, apparently, in the Kiskardi Mountains on the planet Dunedin. And, uh, and Astri's like, you bought a house? When did this happen? What is going on? And Qui-Gon thinks... Qui-Gon's like, okay, well, whatever. You will be safer there, but the bounty hunter is relentless. Who knows? So, uh, here on Chapter 10, we're going to read from the top here. There's a nice little exchange between Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. As they entered the cool halls of the Jedi Temple, Qui-Gon saw the relief Obi-Wan tried to hide. The boy was worn out. Qui-Gon had not expected that the short stop to meet Dee Dee would spiral into a twisting mystery that they would be forced to solve. I did not plan for this, Padawan, he told him. I just wanted to stop by to say hello to a friend. Obi-Wan nodded. But a friend was in danger. You could not uh, refuse to help. You did not approve, Qui-Gon said. He saw the hesitation on Obi-Wan's face. He knew the look well. Obi-Wan hated to disappoint him, but he never lied to him. No, he said. Not at first, but I do now. You say I need to connect to the living force. More and more, I see what you mean. My first impulse was to turn away from Dee Dee. Obi-Wan met his master's eyes. I tried. <laughs> I was tired and hungry, and I did not like Dee Dee. I thought only of my needs. Now I see what you see. Dee Dee has faults, but he's a good being. It just takes longer for me to see these things. I wish... Obi-Wan said with some difficulty. It did not. You are too hard on yourself, Padawan, Qui-Gon said quietly. That can become a fault if you you are not careful, for anger at oneself is a destructive thing. Every living being can be impatient, can turn away at a first glance, can avoid getting involved. It is a natural impulse. We are all creatures who want peace and comfort, yet we are Jedi. Our own peace and comfort is not what drives us. We are dedicated to a larger good, but always remember that the peace and comfort of just one being is what drives us too. Obi-Wan nodded. Qui-Gon put, his gen- put a gentle hand on his shoulder. Get something to eat, Padawan, he said. I am going to go speak with Yoda and Tall. Ooh, threesome. Uh... Whoa, whoa! <laughs> Don't speak about Yoda this way. No. Way. No, that they should not not sexualize Yoda. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yaddle's him, right him there. And, yeah, I, Yaddle's right there. I'll you're, force him. Saying that right in front of Yaddle? <laughs> anyway, uh, that's a great little scene. Obi-Wan has learned his lesson about judging people. It's uh, good. You know, for now, it'll yeah. happen again. <laughs> yes. Um, but hey, that's how it works. Watch Mad Men sometimes. Change is not a linear path. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> Tall, uh, the, he meets Tall in the Room of a Thousand Fountains. Oh, classic and, room, uh, classic room. Is, and and uh, uh, he, uh, uh, Tall says to him, I hope you allowed Obi-Wan to get a decent meal, she called in a humorous tone before mm. she could speak. That poor boy is always hungry. Classic and, uh, flirting. And uh, Qui-Gon says something, well, I'm sure he's on his second helping of food by now. So <laughs> oh, oh, man, he's... so playful. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh tall has discovered something about our nameless bounty hunter 
She is a master of disguise, and this must explain how Obi-Wan saw her transform from an old man. So uh, Yoda shows up, and Qui-Gon informs them how the situation has become worse. Fly has been murdered, Dee Dee's been attacked, and uh, when he mentions that Fly was drained of blood, both Tall and Yoda perk up like they know something. Uh, Qui-Gon demands to know, and it turns out that Senator Zorn had a son, Ren Zorn, and he came, she came to the temple because she believed Ren Zorn uh, was Force-sensitive. So they invited him to the temple, but she had a hard time letting go, and the boy had a hard time connecting to the Force. It confused and angered him, so he left and became a drifter, and six months ago, on Simpla 12, he had been strangled and his body was drained of blood. Oof. That's a rough story. That right is. Right there. Okay. Is that the end of the chapter? Yeah, that's the end of the chapter. Oh! <laughs> I'm going to leave that in where I ask him at the end of the chapter. Yes. Why not? I don't feel like editing this week. We're recording in person. Let's have some fun. And by that, I mean not more work for me later this week. There we go. All right, chapter 11. Oh, no! I'm falling into the pit of despair. The pit of bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Qui-Gon interrupts Obi-Wan's tart eating. He's eating a tart. <laughs> Obi-Wan's eating tarts. You, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I drank. I had no clue where you were going with that. Because you mentioned the falling. And I'm like, well, a character falls later on in this book. Did he jump a chapter? And I have, I was had a gulp full of water. And then you pulled that bankruptcy joke on me. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so... Uh, Qui-Gon, he interrupts Obi-Wan, he's eating tarts, um, and he's like, I'm sorry, Padawan, we gotta go, and they have to go to the Senate office and see the Senator Sorn again, and, uh, when they meet with her, she confirms that she is retiring because of grief over the death of her son, and, uh, I want to read a little something from page 75, uh, and 76, I believe, here we are, uh, um, all right, so I'll start here with Qui-Gon about halfway down the page. Okay. I do not wish to bring up something that is no doubt painful for you, Qui-Gon said gently, but it is your son's, but it is your son's death. Ah! But is your son's death the reason you are leaving? Senator Zorn's face changed, her features hardened, and her lips thinned. Yes, I know why you are here. I should have given him up for the temple training. I was selfish. No, Qui-Gon said quickly, not at all. Many parents choose to keep a Force-sensitive child. There are many paths in life. You make the best choice you can for your child. So I chose to keep him with me, and that decision destroyed him, Senator Zorn said biting uh, bitterly. I chose a path that led to death. No, Ren chose his own path. Another Star Wars Ren also chose his own path. Yes, he did. Uh... Qui-Gon said firmly, Senator Sorn, I do not know you, but I have uh, but I have known many Force-sensitive children. There is no more guarantee of a Force-sensitive child will grow up to find happiness than one who does not have that ability. Many do not choose the Jedi path. Some flourish outside the temple, and some do not. We are not here to question your decision or to blame you. There is no need. I blame myself, Senator Zorn said fle- bleakly. Ever since I heard the news of Ren's death, I've been unable to focus, unable to do my job the way it needs to be done. I have managed to concentrate for only I I have managed to concentrate only for brief periods of time. What right do I have to serve my people when I could not save my son? I cannot answer that question for you, Qui-Gon said, but perhaps you are right to take time apart from your life's journey. I have found such a time helpful. If you can look at your choice with, choices with forgiveness and calm. Forgiveness and calm seem very far away when your son's dead, Senator Zorn said in a choked voice. She spun her chair around to the back, so the back was to them. When she turned again, she had composed herself. But if you didn't come here to blame me, you certainly didn't come here to counsel me, Qui-Gon Jinn. What is it that you're looking for? There we go. 
That's a powerful that scene. That is. So, um, at this point, you know, uh, he's like, okay, okay. Like, I'm trying to help you out, but obviously Qui-Gon's good. He knows when somebody needs the help and when they aren't ready to accept it. And it, uh, he's, he's a very uh, caring person. So, anyway, Qui-Gon changes the subject. He asks why she didn't report the data pad theft. And uh, she says it would have been pointless. My friend Jenna, interesting, had also had her data pad stolen at the same time. And uh, she, uh, and uh, they know, and uh, I'm sorry, and Qui-Gon or Obi-Wan, I'm not sure which, they ask about uh, whether she interacted with someone who looked like Fly. They describe Fly with spindly, long face, big ears, and... uh, and uh, so she's like, yeah, he came up to our table and and recommended Dee Dee's Cafe to Jenna Zan Arbor. And uh, and uh, so he, he took both data pads, clearly, and that's what's happening in there. And so the Jedi are like, see you later. We're, and we got to go off and see Jenna Zan Arbor. So they go see Jenna Zan Arbor. Fancy hotel. Obi-Wan's uncomfortable. This hotel is so fancy. They get up to Jenna's room, and this is where Qui-Gon lays his interrogation techniques on hard. You knew Fly? Why'd you leave the restaurant early? You're friends with Senator Zorn? You know her kid is dead, right? Could I get a list of names at your dinner party? Why didn't you report your data pad stolen? Uh, this again brings up uh, uh, Senator Zorn's uh, re- resignation and how it presented... Uh, prevented her from pushing a piece of legislation legislation um having seen the ropes of the interrogation game this is when obi-wan jumps in and he goes do you know what the legislation was and from what she knows a coalition of planets were trying to outlaw some tech gang that's it that's the connection Obi-Wan doesn't even need to look at Qui-Gon. They got what they needed. Yes. So they thank Jennifer for her time and they dismiss themselves. They need to go speak to Helb again, the SoCal Nemoidium. Um, <laughs> but it's getting late, so they're going to wait till morning. Um, they leave the hotel excited with their newfangled clue, only to find out that their speeder that has been surrounded by other parked speeders. So Qui-Gon gets the parking attendant. He asks, could you move some of these speeders so we get out, you know, we can get out? Park attendant, sure. So Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon are trying to get in the vehicle, and all of a sudden, one of the other speeders backs into their speeders, and this causes Obi-Wan to fall backwards onto the back of the speeder because he was, like, getting in. So he is holding on to the back of the speeder, and the speeder is right up against a guardrail that overlooks a cliff basically and Qui-Gon he jumps from the driver's seat he's going to stop the clerk but the clerk strikes the speeder again and Obi-Wan falls off the guardrail into space he immediately uses his liquid cable launcher to break his fall (laughs) and uh, he climbs back up and the clerk is gone Qui-Gon suggests the boy uh, was the bounty hunter uh, it transformed, of course, and uh, at least the like. And Qui Gon notes that well, at least they're the bounty hunter still in Coruscant, not going after Dee Dee and Astri. Uh, and uh, they're tired. They're tired, Levi. They are exhausted. So, Long day. When they get back to the temple, Qui Gon lays awake at night on his sleep couch, and he's thinking, you know, tech raiders behind everything makes kind of a logical sense i understand this but he couldn't stop thinking about jenna zan arbor and something she did she made a comment an interesting comment when she said that you know death murder uh, is is nasty business she said especially for the victim Ooh. Interesting. So that's an interesting comment. It's a weird little jokey comment she made in a very serious conversation. And it's just sticking in his head. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't have any theories. Um, but it sticks in his head. Qui-Gon uh, chooses to tell Obi-Wan about his suspicions. Uh, 
but they do leave in the morning uh, to find help. And uh, he's not on Coruscant, which, you know, uh, Obi-Wan's like, this confirms it. He's guilty. You know? uh, <laughs> and so, but uh, Qui-Gon's like, wait a minute. Let's go to Vandor 3. That's where the new uh, uh, headquarters of the Tech Raiders is. And uh, it's a satellite world to Coruscant, so it's a moon or something. And uh, that's where their base is located, and Helb is there. And he tells them that he told, I told you everything I know, man. And, uh, but eventually he does admit that uh, he did have Fly steal the Senator's data pad, but Fly fucked it up, you know. He, he, he stole two data pads, like, what's going on? Um, and, uh... It was apparently, this was a favor. It was a repayment uh, because they played in a game of Sabak uh, or Sabak. I know this is Sabak in Solo, but I always said Sabak and now it's going to fuck me up forever <laughs> for my whole life. You know, this is why they should never make Solo 2 happen. Get out of here. <laughs> um, so, anyway, Helb, uh, I guess, was in a, uh, a Sabak game with uh, with Fly and Dee Dee, um, and uh, he mentions that he might have stolen the second data pad, Jenna Zan Arbor's data pad, to repay someone else, perhaps Dee Dee, because Dee Dee had, it swindles them in Sabic all the time, apparently. And Hell mentions that uh, recently he had to pay a debt back to Dee Dee with a hideout. A house, a hideout, uh, and uh, he recently won that hideout himself from quote an old fool wrapped in a pile of cloaks at the Splendor. Hmm. Huh. And this hideout, of course, is in the Cascardi Mountains. Got it from an old fool in a pile of cloaks. Oh shit. Jedi are gone. They so disappear. They disappear. They go to the Cascardi Mountains and they find a three-story house built into a mountainside. There's no signs of uh, Dee Dee or Astri, so they head to the door, lightsabers in hand. Qui-Gon's like, Obi-Wan, do you feel anything? He feels that Dee Dee and Astri are safe, but danger is very close by. All of a sudden, Dee Dee pops his head out of the door and he's grateful to see the Jedi. Both him and Astri are safe. Uh, Ashtray, though, is she's packing a blaster, and uh, they ask, hey, have you ever used one of those before? And she's like, all you gotta do is just point and shoot. (laughs) It'll be easy. And uh, Obi-Wan is skeptical after having seen her in the kitchen. Whoa! Um, And uh, so uh, we'll find out if she's a decent shot soon enough. So... Qui-Gon, he puts the pressure on Dee Dee one last time. Did Fly give you anything? Your life depends on it. Ashtray butts in, and she's like, Fly gave me something. And she tells them about how she paid Fly to name drop the restaurant around Big Wigs, and that she had paid him for a couple leads. I wonder how she paid them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, Dee Dee, he's impressed that his daughter has paid for leads, a chip right off the old block. <laughs> and, uh, so one day Fly dropped by and he gave her a data pad to hold on to and she put it in a broken oven and she forgot about it until they were packing to go to the mountain. She grabbed it because her data pad was broken. Qui-Gon immediately takes it from her, and he discovers that it's coded, possibly with formulas belonging to Genizad Arbor. He immediately forwards all the data to Tall to break. Then Astri com- starts complaining about the place. She said, when we got here, the caretaker told him that no one's ever here this time of year. We thought that was going to be a good thing, but it's just so damn lonely here. There's just nothing to do. And Qui-Gon is all like, caretaker? And she's like, yeah, she came with the place. She must be a hundred years old. Oh, no, And this is when Qui-Gon grabs his lightsaber, and he's like, we gotta get out of here now. Astri's like, but what about our things? Qui-Gon's like, 
leave them. We must leave now. And suddenly, the house goes into full panic mode, and Durasteel shades cover the windows, and you can hear clicking all over the house of all the doors locking. All, all of a sudden, Astri transforms into Kristen Stewart, and Dee Dee transforms into Jodie Foster. <laughs> it's a panic room! <laughs> so... Sorry. Chapter 15. Oh, God. <laughs> I didn't know that was Kristen Stewart. I didn't it, know that was Kristen Stewart. Her movie. daughter's Kristen Stewart. Wow. Okay. It's, it's a solid movie. Very minor, Fincher, but yeah. Good. Anyway, Qui Gon. He powers down the lights, tells Astri, hold on to that data pad. It can be leverage. It, she won't hurt you if you, have the, if you have the data pad, or she doesn't know where the data pad is. Astri and Dee Dee. Uh, they should stay between the Jedi at all times as they cut through the Durasteel walls. The bounty hunter attacks. Um, the Jedi, they uh, lead her up a few different platforms in this space. Okay, this is... And uh, they order Didi and Astra to hide in cubby holes. And uh, Obi-Wan engages the bounty hunter directly. She's... Um, but she's frustrated... By this, you know, uh, Obi-Wan jumps up and grabs pipes overhead. They're at the ceiling and manages to kick the bounty hunter down. And she lands head first. Boom. Boom. <laughs> Boom. And, uh, and uh, she just, she's done. Uh, she's knocked out. And so, uh, is she unconscious? We don't know, actually. But... Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon, they cut through the walls very quickly, and everyone runs out to the Jedi's transport. The bounty hunter sabotaged it, of course. They can't operate it. So then they run over to Dee Dee's ship. Same thing. But then, just as they realize that both ships are down, the bounty hunter returns, heading straight for Obi-Wan. Yep. And we got, uh, this is a heavy action scene, very well written, so I'm going to paraphrase it in a far less exciting way. Read you can the, read the book. Read the book. Read, this is something we used to say a lot. Read the book. Read exactly. The book. Exactly. So, um. Especially the, when we used to take terrible notes. We were just like, yes. Read, read the, the book. Read the book. Um, so the bounty hunter is pissed at Obi-Wan. She's coming straight for him. Qui-Gon jumps in between them, and in this very short span of time, with these lightning-quick Jedi reflexes, Obi-Wan takes the opportunity, he's like, the bounty hunter has to have a ship, so he starts scanning the mountainside, and guess what? He finds it. It's a white ship, and it's on top, it's on the crag below them. So he points to it, and Dee Dee and Astri, they go for it. He says, don't wait for us, take off if you have to. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon tangle with the bounty hunter until she gets some distance between them. She is heading for Dee Dee and Astri, and she's full of surprises because the suit she's wearing has these retractable, like, wings, and she becomes a sled. And she starts sliding down the mountain. <laughs> this is like some true, is, true James Bond shit. Yeah, I love it. I so, love it. So she's sliding. Some true, the great spy who loved me. Mm, shit. Okay, we'll keep the, going. The exciting keep going. opening keep going. scene, but uh, an exciting film. Yes. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> they follow, and she, as she's sliding down the uh, thing, she. Uh, she gets out her whip, and Ashtree feels the grip of the whip, and it wraps, <laughs> it wraps around her ankle. And uh, uh, so, uh, and then, so she wraps around Ashtree's ankle, and she busts out a blaster, and she shoots Dee Dee. Dee Dee hits the ground. So Obi Wan breaks off from the pursuit to go check on Dee Dee. He's bleeding, but he uh, Obi Wan. She's got some Bacto on his utility belt. He throws some Bacto on that. Dee Dee's going to be all right. So he looks up to see uh, Astri is on the ground and the bounty hunter's foot is on her chest and the bounty hunter is about to kill her, take the data pad. Qui-Gon is not going to make it in time. At this moment, Obi-Wan summons the force and he rocket jumps to the top of the crag. He runs to the summit, the crest, that peak of the crag, and he leaps off for another flying super kick right for the bounty hunter's shoulders. She goes flying back into the snow, and Obi-Wan, he's standing on top of her, and she speaks for the first time, You will 
pay. And with one hand, she pulls out a vibro blade and she chucks it at Ashtree. And Obi Wan tries to stop it before it's uh, thrown, but he doesn't quite nail the timing. So he, with his lightsaber, he flicks it and he cuts off a few of her hands, uh, a few of her fingers, oh, and then man. he dives into the snow, catching the blade. Uh, the hunt, the bounty hunter scurries away, and Qui-Gon is in quick pursuit on page 117 here. Obi-Wan watched as Qui-Gon gained on the bounty hunter. She scrambled onto her cruiser. The engines fired and the loading ramp began to close. Qui-Gon gave a great leap and landed. Horrified, Obi-Wan saw the flash of a blaster. Qui-Gon staggered. Master, Obi-Wan screamed. Qui-Gon fell onto the, into the bowels of the ship. The sh- ramp retracted. The ship rose in the air and shot away into the upper atmosphere. Obi-Wan could hear, as if for the first time, the wind whispering along the surface of the snow. Astri raggedly breathed behind him. The echo of his own miscry- mis- of his own ang- anguished cry reverberated off the mountain as he watched the ship disappear. Excuse me. <laughs> Don't edit that out. Um, had Qui-Gon been captured by the bounty hunter, or had he captured her? Was he mortally wounded? Was he alive or dead? The anguish of not knowing made Obi-Wan want to crash to his knees, but there was wounded to care for. Qui-Gon had, been, had told him to stay. Don't lose heart, Qui-Gon, he whispered. I'll find you. Hold on. He would find a way to bring back his master. And that's the end of the book. That that's a huge cliffhanger. That's a the biggest cliffhanger play. we've had really since Defenders of the Dead. I would mm-hmm. say. So, uh, which is when Obi Wan left the order. The, yes. So uh, on Melita Dawn. So this is the next. I think this is clearly the next big arc coming up, and we got some interesting stuff. I'm just just looking at covers here. I I I'm not, I don't try to look at any stuff. And we didn't read these books as children, so. Um, but some interesting stuff coming up. It looks like maybe tall factors pretty heavily in the next couple of books. It's very exciting. It's um, funny you mentioned covers because we have not read this book series before. But the next book, The Evil Experiment, I read as a child. Like I oh. picked it up. And the reason I picked it up is because the cover blew me away of like Qui-Gon is like chained to what looks to be like... Uh, uh, what's that? Like a uh, like a wheel. Yeah, like some sort of wheel, and there's these evil pink eyes. And we'll I'm... we'll talk about that cover in that book and that experience, which will be maybe interesting to see if you, you should try to write some notes about like what do you remember? Yeah, I don't really and remember anything. I'm sure so, you remember yeah. nothing. But <laughs> this book, The Deadly Hunter. Uh, actually, since you mentioned covers, before we get into our final thoughts, let's talk about the cover of this book. You mentioned before we started recording that you thought this was a really good cover. I thought it was a very bad cover. <laughs> and the well, main reason is because it looks like a PlayStation 1 game cover to me, which I think is a negative comment from me. <laughs> and uh, um, I just think the bounty hunter on it looks a little goofy. That's all. It's not terrible, but when I got to this book, we we had been kind of lukewarm in the last two books, mm-hmm. and when I looked at this cover, and again, never judge a book by its cover, but when I looked at this cover, I was like, oh man, like is the post-Xanatos era of this series just going to be kind of not that great? Mm-hmm. I was a little concerned, because I was like, this just looks low-rent and junky. And then when I read the note about the probable ghostwriters, I was like, oh boy, like maybe this is, maybe it's just like that first like eight books is like an incredible run, and then you know it falls it, off. Yeah, but uh, uh, but this is what I'll say. This book is actually very good. I this is huge. I'm I love this book. I love Dee Dee and Astri. Mm-hmm. I think they are great new characters. I love I love the Coruscant underworld. I love the fact that all the Jedi love Dee Dee. Like, even, like you know, it's nice. It's a nice humanizing element. The, the humor of the Jedi. that we didn't have in the last books is back for sure. There's there's something in the mm. these this book that wasn't in the past two books. And uh, I just I felt uh, I really I really am a fan of this book and the new characters especially. And it was very tight. I have to say, like, even though these books are all short, 
sometimes there's like it feels like especially it feels like the pace is very slow in the beginning and then they kind of have to rush yeah, a little yeah, bit in the climax whereas this like felt very like this is a, to be honest this is one of my favorite books in the series it's not the most monumental like character wise but this just felt like if you want just a, I mean it ends on a cliffhanger sure but if you want just a solid adventure with these characters this is about as good as it can get for me. Like, I love just all the Coruscant stuff. The bounty hunter was cool and intimidating and and interesting. I'm curious to learn more about her. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, I just... I, I, I thought this book was great. Um, I... I, uh, I will... I, I'm, I don't know if I'm willing to go... It's definitely... I'm not going to say it's conceived in midi-chlorians. It's, it's difficult mm-hmm. for me to say that. Like unless the book is just like towering, uh, and I'm not sure it's that. It's difficult even for me to give a ten right now because I don't think we've given that many tens. I think we gave. I think I gave one ten. There's only been one ten, and that's the hidden, the hidden, hidden pass. pass. Oh, see though, that's... I feel like I've liked other books more since then, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. We're gonna have a big retrospective well... at the end, and we'll talk about our favorite books and favorite characters. But uh, the Deadly Hunter, um, I'm gonna go full. I'm gonna go nine. Okay. Um, I, 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 you know, and again, these ratings are all subject to change. I don't know exactly when I give ratings, but a nine, I mean, that's, that's very high marks. And you know what? Uh, Obi-Wan learned a lot of lessons in this, but he needed to learn those lessons. And you know what? He needs to learn his lesson more because I'm not going to give him the, I'm not giving him the rating this week. It's going to be Qui-Gon Jinn. Qui-Gon is so fun yeah. in this book. He's so entertaining. Qui-Gon, he's, he's palling around with these underworld friends. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, oh, man. Uh, and, he, he, you know, him and Tall, they, they want to fuck. And it's just a delight. It a is. delight. I love this book. Uh, I'm very excited about the next book. This cliffhanger is maddening. We have another non-Jedi Apprentice book next week. So it's good. we're, oh, we're going to be... We'll I'm talk about so that I'm so mad end. about this. So. Uh, but, uh, you know, hey, we got to... We got to keep our format, baby. All right, here's what I'm gonna say. here's what I'm gonna say about this book. You okay. mentioned all of the points, cliffhanger, thrilling conclusion. The book is a murder mystery. Um, great characters. One of my favorite things: lots of mention of food. That Obi Wan, he's you a love, growing you boy. You love when he's hungry. And, he's a growing boy. This series clearly takes place in roughly two years. He's that, that's that's a big there's a big couple of years yeah, thirteen to fifteen. You're a big you, 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 before that you're a little boy and after that you're you're a big boy. Yes, you're a big boy when you're you getting, get when you get to fifteen. You're a big boy. You're ordering the mighty kids meal yeah. at, the, <laughs> at McDonald's. All right, so um, I'm going to. I'm I'm going for it. I'm giving this book a ten. Whoa! But yeah, and here's. Here's why I'm giving this book a 10. I'm flavoring it Yoda. Yoda's in the book. Yoda's Not there. a huge character. Well written. No jokey Yoda this week. Um, but the other book I gave a 10 is The Hidden Past. The Hidden Past, I think, up until this point, was the best in the series because there's so emotion. There's a very emotional death in it. However, The Hidden Past has a very weak cover. Nothing about the cover oh, is anything uh, in the book. This, and that's... That, a, I, I agree the cover that, of Hidden Pass is weak. That, and that's a problem with some of these books, because sometimes the covers are misleading. We never talked about the cover of the, um, the, uh, the... What is the one where they end up at the school? The two books ago. Oh, uh, uh, oh, the fight for truth. The fight for truth and the crazy phantasm orbs on the cover, which I guess is supposed to be the opening scene, but it's like not the opening scene. Yeah. Everything on this cover is in the book. We got a swoop. We got a laser whip. We got a, f- a humanoid female in some sort of plastoid armor. This is not. There's no punches. I agree. No... There's no false advertising happening. That does not mean it's a good cover. I don't understand why you hate this cover. I just so think much. that it's like a weird looks like I mean it looks like it's the cover of like a Dino Crisis game. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I mean whatever. Like I just think there have been better covers, you know. I I I think, you know, like I, I, I I, I think the mark of the crown is the high water mark. Yeah, it is. The mark of the crown is the best cover in so far. And so anyway, yeah, it's, it's a ten, and it's a ten because it has a better cover 
than the other book that I gave a 10. That's all I got to say. Um, but uh, something I want to talk about, Tim, is we got some cliffhangers here. Let's talk about some of these. Who do you think hired the bounty hunter? Well, um, clearly the big theory going into the ending here is Jenna Zan Arbor. Mm-hmm. That's who I would but think. But leaving you on that cliffhanger and then, you know, think about it in real time, two months. It's like people, like, you gotta, you gotta subvert that expectation a little bit. I'm not sure, um, you know, but right now, I mean, that's who I would guess. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know. Probably the one who hired the bounty hunter. But do you think the bounty hunter is this murderer? Because we have this string of unsolved murders where people have been strangled and the bodies have been drained of blood. That hasn't been answered either. Yeah, that's not how she... That doesn't seem to be her style. No, it doesn't. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot going on. I'm curious where Qui-Gon's taken by the bounty hunter. What's this evil experiment going on? Some, sometimes the titles mean more times than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. I, I think uh, there's a lot... Uh, this is a real compelling mystery, I will say. Like, sometimes the mysteries in books like this are relatively simple um, and straightforward and not particularly compelling, but uh, Jude's actually pretty good at that. The mystery Mm -hmm. stuff in these books is usually pretty compelling and solid. And, like, this is definitely the most I've enjoyed one of these books probably since the Melita Dawn stretch, Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, I had some issues with some plotting stuff, but like I thought was definitely the most compelling character work in the series. I agree. So, uh, and especially with the Xanato stuff falling a little flat too. Like I, there was more in the Xanato stuff that I wanted that we didn't get. Yeah, I kind of yeah. I you know I liked Day of Reckoning. There's a lot of things I like about it, but it felt like a bit of a premature end to that story. Um, and but uh, we're gonna clearly find out more about Qui Gon's past coming in up two in weeks. In two weeks, we will be covering the evil experiment. But next week, as we announced last week, we announced our whole schedule for the summer. Go back to that episode. We'll, we'll post pro- something. We'll yeah. post something. We'll, we'll we'll have a we'll have a graphic of some sort, uh, winding up our schedule for the rest of the summer. But uh, next week, we got "Join the Resistance," which is a novel by Ben Acker and Ben Blacker. Real well, names, apparently real names. We'll talk more about them next week. But this is a book, it takes place, um, I think it starts about six months before The Force Awakens, and it's about young Resistance fighter pilots. And uh, so, uh, if you guys haven't read that, which a lot of you might have, but a lot of you might not have, uh, check that book out. It's uh, available, uh, if you can't find it in your local store, I bet it's probably available digitally. So, uh, it, it... it's easier to find the newer books are probably easier to jump on in some ways because you don't have to go through thrift books or ebay or something but uh yeah so join us next week for that uh no post no end of episode segment we talked a lot of wikipedia stuff in this we, so. we, we got a lot of, we got a lot of wikipedia stuff throughout the episode so but we do want your letters guys send the letters send letters Padawan Library at gmail.com. We're talking to you, your, our loyal listeners. Uh, and any question. Any it doesn't even have to be Star Wars doesn't related. doesn't even have to be Star Wars related. Obviously, prefer to be Star Wars related. But it certainly doesn't need to be related to the books. It could be anything. So You could ask us about recent Star Wars news. You can ask about, us about... Hey, hey you can, again, you can ask us... We talked a lot about other movies and stuff <laughs> yeah. in this episode. If you were like, what? Did Man. You, did if you, you just happen to be like a huge... Mad Max fan or something, and you want to talk to us about, you know, Tina Turner, uh, then there's, I got a lot of Tina Turner thoughts, you know, put her in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is what I say, she can't only be in there with Ike, come on, that's gross. So, so <laughs> moving on, uh, <laughs> um, join the book club, and you know what, the you listeners who are already listening, you, you are in the book club. You're in the book club. But tell your friends, I have some perks here. Of being a member of the book club. Oh. One of these is extracurricular activity always looks good on Jedi report cards and resumes and applications <laughs> to further Jedi oh. colleges. Um, 
Uh, you will be a member of a small, tight-knit squad, making you instantly cooler than most people. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's it. That was just the only okay, two points. They, I, <laughs> you know. All right. Well, uh, so anyway, next week, join, right. join the resistance. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening. Hang on. You usually say your, your thing. At the end, yes, you know that one little phrase. Yeah. I got a little thing to throw on top of it, and then oh, you say no. it. All right. Oh no! So, until the books are due back, the library is closed. <laughs> Padawan Library is hosted and produced by Tim May and Levi Peretic. It is edited by Tim May. Our theme song is by the Astral Project. Our artwork is by Freddie Fun Buns. Padawan Library is copyright 2019 by Tim May and Levi Peretic. All rights reserved.